Afternoon. Um, for those who I haven't met, my name is Dave Rosen. I primarily, during the day, run the Captive Pinniped Research Program, both at the Vancouver Aquarium and at the Open Water Research Site that um, we've heard a little bit about already. Um, I'm starting my talk sort of uncharacteristically with a very serious, um, serious quote, because, you know, I always give a serious talk. And, um, and also, I think it kind of sums up uh, my interest is quote, a physiologist, although I hate that term, of um, my interest is trying to, in the conservation view, try to figure out what the connection is between change in the environment and change in the population. And I view that as what is happening to the individual animal. So how does physiology and behavior, how are they affected? How is that ultimately going to drive population? Because that's the, the individual animal is the link between the change that we're all observing on the oceans and the change in the numbers that we're all worried about ultimately. So um, I've been doing this for a while. So I, I want you just to cast your minds back to 2003. And 2003 was kind of a benchmark year for a lot of new stuff and experimentation and science and living on the edge. And, and so we had things like the completion of the Human Genome Project. Um, we had Galileo crashing into Jupiter on purpose. Um, we elected, you know, in the States, a totally unsuitable candidate for political office. <laughs> Never going to see that happen again. <laughs> and, and probably the biggest, the biggest experimentation of the year uh, occurred at the MTV Music Awards. <laughs> but, but 2003 was also uh, notable for the opening of our open uh, water research station in Port Moody, which Aaron gave you a brief overview of. Um, it was you know, the grand experiment for us. We really had no clue whether it was going to work at all. We started small with an animal. Um, and over the last, it's been 13 years, 10 years since we've actually been publishing hard data on this. Um, and so I was asked by an editor uh, of a journal, he said, you've been talking about this for a long time, Dave. Um, can you put together a synopsis of what you found, what your scientific journey has been? with this rather remarkable scientific uh, paradigm that we've established, which is really there, again, to emphasize, before that, and we still have animals at the Vancouver Aquarium, who's one of our valuable partners in this project, but we are always physically limited at the aquarium by pool size. Marine mammals are really good at diving and swimming, and they can only do so much of that, even in your biggest tank. And so 13 years ago, Andrew Trite said, well, let's take them out and see what happens. Let's take them out where so where." environmental constraints are not an issue. And from then on, we found some really amazing things. And so I got to sit down, and over about you know, two years, I got to write up what I've been doing as part of a vast team at the Open Water Research Site. And this uh, just appeared this year online. It'll come out in you know, paper copy if they still have those things. And it's a summary of our scientific journey with the animals at Open Water Research, just focusing on the diving physiology side of things. So we've done a lot of other cool stuff as well. But that's what this, um, this article was about. And so I thought what I'd do is give you a really, really brief overview of some of the things we found over that years. One of the things that was, that was fun about this, no, this isn't the overview. This actually appears in the paper. And one of the reviewers, you know, we, we nag reviewers because we think they just make life Hard, but they actually suggested do a flow chart. And we found out this flow chart not only highlighted the questions which are kind of in the grayer boxes that we are our central experimental questions, but also the flow of science, of what one study led to understanding one thing, which of course led to more questions, which of course is what science is all about and why it's exciting. So I'm, I'm going to take you through some of the highlights of this. Um, you know, hey, download the paper illegally. That'd be great and take a look at some of the details. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd take it sort of, what's the approach, who, who, what's one of the audiences for this type of stuff? And that is scientists trying to talk to people who are invested in the answers. Um, so I've got, you know, Mr. Typical Scientist there. Um, you know, some similarity there. Um, certainly, you know, this part. Um, and, and, you know, who's he explain it to? And usually, usually we, we have to explain it to resource managers. And because we're in the conservation business, those, that's the action point, is getting it to people who are making the management decisions. So I needed something that, that you know, properly demonstrated you know, you know, management and government workers. Um, so I have Patrick here. 
Um, Graham, I know you're not offended because you're retired now from DFO. So, um, so this is this is sort of my my short explanation of a conversation between these two of what we found so far. And so the most obvious question, and the one we started with in our program, and we naively thought this was going to be this most thing, is what is their metabolic rate? What is the cost of diet? And we thought this would be the easiest thing, because as Aaron. Um, talked about and as, as Rhea alluded to, marine mammals are really good at like down regulating everything when they're diving. And so the general impression is it doesn't cost them anything to dive. In fact, it's probably cheaper for them to dive than to not dive. And we did find that the cost of diving could be really low for these guys, but they weren't really diving. They were basically cowering at the bottom, not moving. Okay, so yes. They could batten down the hatches and have a really low cost of diving, but that's not what they're normally doing. So, okay, so if that's not what they're normally doing, what is the cost when they're normally doing? Do we have a cost? Well, sort of, but it depends. Depends on what they're doing, what kind of dives they're taking. Is it a series of dives or a single dive? How deep are they diving? How long are they diving? What are they doing underwater? There is no single number. Now, is that because of this great dive reflex? So in other words, if it's not costing them a lot, is that because their heart rate's dropping? Things like that. Again, sort of. Yeah, we could map out all these great physiological adjustments that they were making, and that allowed them to stay under. But unfortunately, it, that didn't always correlate to how much energy they were using during the dive. And that becomes important because we wanted to know, could we use measurements like heart rate or activity to predict how much energy they're using. It's one thing to measure these stellar sea lines at open water, but we want to measure the energy ultimately of sea lines out in the wild. So can we just use things like heart rate or body movement through accelerometers to, you know, here's the Fitbit. Can we attach a Fitbit to these guys or a heart rate monitor and predict how much energy they're using? Well, sort of, again. Under very gross circumstances, these type of measures work, but we were kind of the dragon slayer in a lot of these. When we looked at fine scale changes, it turned out a lot of the technologies, which in some cases scientists were already using to study wild stellar sea lines, weren't as strong as they appeared to be under some laboratory conditions. The other thing we looked at, again, uh, Aaron already sort of alluded to this, is we wanted to know what the reactions were of these sea lines and what the costs and benefits of changes behavior were when they were faced with different foraging conditions, uh, whether it was deeper prey or more abundant prey. So one of our studies, uh, several of our studies, actually looked at what happens when you change prey abundance. How do the sea lions react? Is it better for the sea lions um, to have more prey, or does it really not affect their behavior? And we found that, yeah, it, not surprising, it was better for the sea lions to have more prey at depth. And not surprising, when there was more prey at depth, they stayed down longer. It was a good spot to be. Problem is, then they had to recover longer. Aaron already talked about, it. stay down longer, you have to recover longer. So that was the trade-off they had to make. But then when we modeled that behavior, we found that overall, they actually gained more energy. And that sounds great. You got more food, you gain more energy, that's fantastic. Okay, let's reverse that though. If food is more scarce, proportionally, you're getting even less energy than you would predict just by counting how many fish there are. Now, I, I, this is the question at this point the managers are usually asking the scientists. Why do, and you know, the, here's the answer we'd all like to give. <laughs> <laughs> but scientifically, what, the world is complicated. Animals are complicated. Um, physiology is complicated. Um, the interaction between the environment, the physiology, and behavior of the individual and populations is really complicated. People are always going to be pressed for simple answers, but they're not necessarily going to be more accurate or useful answers. And so I think one thing that our study has done is try to describe in a simplistic manner without oversimplifying how changes in the environment could be affecting individual animals without giving a single number, without giving a single answer, to show the complexity in the system that you need to understand in order for your predictions to actually mean anything. Um, the one thing I'd like to do, it's usually at the end of the talks, we have a, a big 
figure about all our funding agencies and, and you know, I don't think that's the important thing with something like the Open Water Research Station. Um, I think what's important is, you know, it takes a village, literally, um, perhaps a small town. We have the researchers, the grad students, who are all working hard out there. Um, we have the animals, of course. We have our employees and our partners at the Vancouver Aquarium, the trainers, the vet staff. Um, it, this is a nice day. You know, most of you live on the West Coast. You know what it's like eight months of the year. Imagine working out. And so I, you know, co-authors get recognition on these publications, and what doesn't get enough recognition is the tremendous effort of all the people who have supported us over the last 13 years on doing what we think are really good scientific uh, experiments at the Open Water Research Site. Thank you. So, pretty complicated. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I'm just I, wondering how... Sorry, could I just say one thing? I, I wasn't joking about you can download. Just don't tell anyone. Um, the publication, I believe, is up on our website. So um, if you want to... <laughs> don't tell anyone. Just between us. <laughs> and the thousand people online. <laughs> um, <laughs> just between us. <laughs> So I encourage you, I, it, and it's written sort of like it's more like a story than a normal scientific journal article. So, so Dave, still when we get back to the managers, yeah, they're concerned that sea lions can't get enough fish. Right. And so, how do you take your physiology to help them understand the ability of sea lions to find fish or if they can't get enough fish? How do we make those links? Well, that's that's kind of the whole endeavor of the project is to design experiments under controlled conditions which are artificial um, and apply them to the complicated world that's happening you know, in the wild. And so you have to do it through clever design and careful interpretation of the results. And what we do is we say, okay, what do you think is happening as managers or other scientists think is happening in the wild? Analyze one aspect of that giant change that is happening, saying, okay, let's manipulate that in a controlled environment, just like you do with most science, and see if the results with the individual sea lines, whether it's physiology or behavior, changes in the direction we would suppose. And does that lend support to the hypothesis of what's happening with animals in the wild? So it's a supporting or a non-supporting documentation of the facts through careful controlled experiments but we're not trying to, nor will we ever try to duplicate what is happening in the wild. And sometimes they have trouble with that. Managers go, well, it's not wild sea lions, therefore, you know, it's not the same thing. Well, thank God it's not the same thing, because we can actually interpret results. Dave, would it be too simplistic to think of it this way? Um, from the point of view of a fish, um, the, the, the <laughs> water doesn't contain much oxygen, so um, so a marine mammal is like a rocket ship coming down from above, packing all this oxygen from the surface, and and is capable of of having a, of doing things that are energetic, so therefore having a high metabolic rate. Um, so it's not much use. So uh, something like a sea lion should have that ability to to be highly energetic down below. Um, and 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 take advantage of that of that uh, you know that uh, asymmetry. Um, on the other hand, crap happens, and um, you know if a sea lion goes or a diving animal goes down, it may not be able to get up again too quickly. A predator, one of my animals, swims along and and and, and confines it to uh, to a crack on the bottom or something. So, I mean, is that partly? Do you think is that thinking wrong? And is that would that be partly why this there's this sort of complex range of of, of results in your in your study, I think I think that that gets back to it, and that's historically when we study seals, and they said, "Oh, the great divers, they took a seal and they stuck its head in a bathtub, and they went, wow, it can hold its breath for a long time," and they thought that was the diving response. Well, similar diving response, but really it's the fear response. One of the one of the huge advantages of having really well trained animals is we can separate out not just the fear, but the the way we conduct the trials, um, it depends on whether the animals have control of the situation or don't have control of the situation can, that can tell us whether it's a usual or a maximum response. 
So in other words, a, a, a case like that about the killer whale predation would be the same thing. If we have a sea lion go down and it decides to quit after two minutes, that is different than having a sea lion go down. It doesn't know how long it's going to be down, and we allow it to quit after two minutes. Because the sea lions are going to go, I don't know how long I'm going to be down. I'm preparing for the worst, under the second case. Which brings up another debate that's just starting to come in, this clarified in the cetacean research, is when we talk about the dive reflex, physiologists traditionally have thought about this as an automatic response. Um, in other words, you can't have, outside of the fear response, you don't, the animal has no control. It's oh, I've been down here for three minutes, so therefore I'm doing this. I'm down here for four minutes, I'm doing this. I don't prepare for dives. Well, now we've seen just recently in the cetacean literature that in fact, not surprisingly, they do have conscious control of things like heart rate. Um, so, I mean, my belief has always been that, um, you ha that animals do have control of their physiological response within a degree, and therefore you have to be careful how you're measuring the animals to make sure that whether you're measuring a voluntary thing or a maximum thing or a fear thing as well is very important. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons we were getting very low responses at first is not only were they not moving at depth, but they didn't know how long they were going to be at depth.